Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. I have been solving math problems for GRE out of this book here. Practicing to take the GRE general test, the 10th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. The problem that I'm about to solve is the one that you're going to find on page number 302. Quantitative comparison question number 15, the very last one. Before I actually solve this problem, let me talk a little bit about it. Let me take a, a couple of minutes to actually talk about this prob problem. I find this question very fascinating, very, very interesting. I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, first of all, it's a fifth question number 15. Uh, this is this, this exam that you have in your hand, this book that you have in your hand. It's comprised of, it's made up of, it's consisting, it consists of seven old-fashioned paper and pencil exam which no longer exist these days today they give you computer exam and where the questions are not arranged in the order of difficulty the difficulty level of the next question that you get in the exam depends on how you performed in the previous questions hence is hence the term computer adaptive this exam is not computer adaptive obviously it's a paper and pencil exam and therefore all the questions back in the old days were arranged in the order of difficulty and since there are 15 of them I know right away that since there are 15 of them and I know that the entire exam was broken up into three parts, easy, medium and hard, therefore I know that 1 through 5 were supposed to be easy, 6 through 10 were supposed to be medium and the last 11, 11 through 5, last 5 rather, the last 5 were supposed to be uh, pure hell. Uh, number 15 is about as hellish as it gets. Only 20% of the people got it right. Let me, let me talk a little bit uh, about these questions as to why I find it fascinating. Number 15 that we are about to solve is the classic example. It's the classic example of a problem that one would present to somebody uh, if one were trying to make a point that most people who are taking the exam do not know how to take the exam. Let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. And the re reason they do not know how to take the exam because they never take a, they never learn the tricks and techniques, which is what I teach in my prep course. I prepare you how to, Knowing material, knowing the material is one thing, but you also need to know how to actually take the exam, which is an entirely different thing altogether. Let me ask you this question. I have 100 people in the room, okay? Let's pretend that I have 100 people in the room, and I'm going to flip a coin, and I'm going to ask people to call out head or tail. About how many people do you expect to be right on, the, on each call? No matter how many times I toss the coin, on each toss, you would expect about 50 people in the room to be right. Because there are only two possibilities, head or tail, that's it. So half the people are going to, on average, on average, half the people are going to say tail, half the people are going to say head, and therefore half the people are going to be right if there are only two choices. In other, in other words, if it's a true-false problem, if, uh, if a question is, a quiz is given to you where the answer is either true or false, even random guessing will tell me that about half the people will get it right purely by random guessing. And therefore, if the people knew how to take this exam, if they knew, which they don't, if they knew, then at least 50%, and I use the word at least 50% of the people should have gotten this question right. The reason I say at least 50% is because if you say that 50% of the people will get this question right, then assume, let's, let's just assume that this question, let me, let me put down the questions on, on the blackboard first. I also want to make sure that I don't end up taking too much time on just talking about it. The question is, X is an integer greater than 1. So we are told that x is an integer, it's a whole number, and we are told it has to be more than 1, which makes my life easy. And you simply ask to compare this thing. 3, to, 3 over x plus 1, 3 raised to x plus 1 versus 4 raised to x. Let's assume, let's assume for the sake of argument, that not a single person, not one person when this particular exam was given knew how to solve this question. Even if that were the case, even if that were the case, it's were because it's hypothetical, even if that were the case, even in that scenario, I would, I would uh, claim that about 50% of people should get this question right. And the fact that there are always some people who know how to solve the problem, because you see this exam is taken by two kinds of people. I don't know how, how, how much I'm getting into this thing. This exam, the GRE that you're, that you're preparing for, is taken by two kinds of people. People who are majoring in pure sciences and people who are majoring in social sciences. People who are majoring in astronomy, physics, chemistry, and even mathematics. 
somebody who has an undergraduate degree in mathematics or has a master's degree in mathematics and wants to get a doctorate in mathematics, wants to become a math professor at a university, also has to take this exam to get to it into a PhD program. And the person who is majoring in social sciences like English, philosophy, sociology, uh, what, what have you, any kind of social science, history, uh, they are also taking this exam. But you don't need to worry, there is, no need to, there, is no need to, there is no reason for you to complain that the, therefore the playing level is not level, playing field is not level rather. There is, no, there is no legitimate reason to complain that because your score is only compared against your cohort. So if you are an English major, your score in math or verbal part is only compared against people from your major. Your score in math is not going to be compared against your score in, uh, in people who are applying to, for electrical engineering major. Do you understand? But anyway, enough said. So, why was I going this thing? So even if we assume that nobody knew this knew these questions, which is of course not true, there is always 10-20% of the people who are pure mathematicians, so physics major, chemistry major, mathematics major, astronomy majors, they would know these questions. They would know how to solve these questions very easily, they will solve it and they will get it right. There are two ways of solving these questions. One is what I call the classical way, the traditional way, the orthodox way, the geeky way, the nerdy way, the proper way, the way that is supposed to be solved using mathematics, pure mathematics. Unfortunately, not too many people know that uh, method. And even if you did know it, to some people it will end up taking inordinate amount of time. It will end up taking unreasonable amount of time. So therefore, that method is useless. What I'm going to show you is what to do with this problem in a quick and dirty way, in an unorthodox method, in, in, in an unorthodox way, in an untraditional way. Okay? Listen, listen to me and, and, and learn. Just give me a second. I'm going to check the camera in the back, see how much time I have. Just give me a second. Oh boy, I have taken seven minutes just talking about it. That's not good. Here's what you do. Plug in a number. Since it has to be more than one, let's plug in two. Two plus one and four raised to two. Two plus one is three, therefore this boils down to three raised to three, which is 27, and this is 16. 16 and 27, based on the work that we have done so far, the answer is A. Notice how I qualify this statement and again if you do not know what qualify means, look it up and learn it. Qualify of course has two meanings, not the primary meaning to qualify for a job, but to qualify in a statement means to attach a string to it, to equivocate, to, to, to as I said to attach strings to it, to, con to, conditional, uh, to, to put conditions on it. Based on the work that I have done so far, you see I am equivocating, I am qualifying my statement, based on the work that we have done so far, the answer is A. What does it tell you? This work that we have done so far does not tell you what the answer is, but it does tell you what the answer is not. You see, answer choice A means quantity in column A is always bigger. Answer choice B means quantity in column B is always bigger. C would mean the two quantities are always equal. Well, the fact that I found one instance where the quantity in column A is greater, that tells me that the answer cannot be B. Because B would have meant that the quantity in column B is always bigger. Quantity in column B cannot be always bigger because I found one instance when it is not. Also it tells me that the answer cannot be C. Because C would have meant that the two quantities are always equal. But two quantities bloody well are not always equal because there is one instance where I can clearly say that they are not. Answer has to be either A or D. I cannot understand why only 20% of the people will get it right. At least 50% of the people should get it right just by pure guessing. His answer is either A or a D. So even if you flip a coin at this point, half the people should have gotten it right. Anyway, continue. All I'm going to do now is very unorthodox, very untraditional, very unmathematical way, non-traditional way, which is just plugging in until I find the contradictions. How far do you go? Do you try two times? Do you try three times? It depends on my mood, depends on how much time I have. So here we go. So now we try two, let's try three. Three plus one and 4 is to 3. 3 plus 1 is 4. I'm going to speak up speed here because we're running out of time. So it's just going to be 27 times 3 which is 81. And here it's going to be 16 times 4 which is 64. You see the answer did not change still. Let's try one more time. 3 is to... Now it's going to be 81 times 3. 81 times 3 is 3 and 24 is 243. Let's see what happens here. 4 is to 4 is going to be 40, 64 times 4. So it's 16, 1, 20, 26, uh, 24 plus 1 is 25, voila, 256, 243, the answer switched. The answer switched, that's it, I'm done. Since I'm getting contradiction, here the answer was A, here the answer was A. 
And now the answer is B. I'm getting contradiction, therefore the answer is D. Voila, we are done. That's it. I hope you found it helpful. If you wish to get hold of me for personal private tutoring, face-to-face -face tutoring, I do tutoring face-to-face, -face. I do tutoring over the phone, through the internet, through Skype, and I also tutor over the telephone. Or if you wish to get hold of me for any other aspect of your GRE preparation, please go to my website at www.keshwaniprep.com or www.prepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepprepp